All right, it's Jeff Mayhew, it's John Beatty, it's Politics and Parenting, where we talk about politics, but we talk about it differently. John, how are you doing today? Doing really well, Jeff. It's been, uh, you know, it's busy, busy month so far, but it was the busiest week. Uh, poor little William broke his foot sledding, so he's in crutches and in a walking boot. Um, but this Saturday, I got to go to this really cool conference on just the importance of religion and society and, you know, some interesting data about sort of America's sort of in general feelings about religion and sort of how it's been a kind of on a downward trend, but um, it was just, you know, and also great to hear from different faiths throughout Loudoun County and uh, learn some more. So it was a really nice uh, event held by my friend. Um, and, uh, you know, once the video is up, I'm sure to send it around so people can watch it, but it's, you know, good to be reminded about the importance of religion in society and really, really religious freedom in general. So how are you? I'm good. Um, I'm sorry to hear about William breaking his breaking his foot. Um, it's life, you know. It's just he was having he was having a blast while he was doing it. So yeah, I mean, I I've broken my foot a time or two in my life as a child as well. You know, um, we all have those incidences. At least he was doing something fun. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. some of us break our feet doing stupid things. You know, so at least he was you know sledding like a like a like a boy is supposed to. Um, yeah, so it was good. But yeah, uh, religious freedom is really important. And you mentioned um, mentioned like how many people used to be faithful to what what it is now and how significant it's changed. I've just uh, been reading uh, my Harry Truman biography back there. And I think that I don't have the, the exact number. I wasn't, I didn't know you were going to bring that up right off the bat. So I don't have the exact number, but I think it was 94% of Americans believed in God at the time that Harry Truman was uh, elected president. Just think about that. Wow. 94% of Americans. And now it is significantly less. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, I think it's probably sub 50% at this point. Um, and you can't help tying the fact that Harry Truman took over after World War II and what he began to have to fight and all of us began to have to fight back then was communism. And communism's main threat was to try to divide from within. You can't help to think that maybe this lack of faith somehow, you know, has something to do with that. But uh, it hasn't gone well for us since, has it? You know, it's, the, yeah, it's possible. Of late, of late, of late, of course. Obviously, we we've done well for ourselves, America. We 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 won World War II. We won the Cold War. You know, but. The long game here, you know, there's there is something more at play in the fact that you do have to kind of fight for religious freedom, you know, and I feel like that wasn't always the case when you were growing up. Maybe maybe it is always the case, you know, but. Well, that's so there's a book I read, um, The Right to be Wrong, just as part of another book club, actually talking about religious freedom. And it was interesting because we have a conception that America was founded on religious freedom, but. The book actually lays out like the Puritans in Boston were actually very, they were very puritanical and they did not appreciate people who actually didn't toe the line. So the Rhode Island colony was founded by people who didn't fit in in uh, the, the Bay Colony, Boston, and they went south uh, to basically start their own place. Um, interesting things about in Virginia, of all things, uh, sort of the uh, establishment of the Church of England and how that kind of became like the ruling religious organization and sort of fought with other groups. And then I think most interestingly, and you talk, talk about fighting, Pennsylvania, we all recognize Pennsylvania. We taught that it was a Quaker colony. Um, the Quakers are very peaceful people. They don't believe in fighting. They actually don't have any oaths. So in the constitution, it says, uh, swear an oath or affirm. That's a nod to Quakerism actually, to allow them to take part in the government and to not have to, make, to, have to go against their beliefs. But the rules of Pennsylvania changed so much since the colony was founded. But by the time the uh, Revolutionary War was going on, there were Quakers that refused to fight because they did believe in fighting. And they were actually being imprisoned by their uh, fellow patriots in, in America because, you know, there was sort of a lack of tolerance for their beliefs. So, you know, a colony that was founded on Quakerism over 100 years, 150 years, actually can change, even though it's got those roots. And so I think that's a key lesson for us that... Um, you know, yeah, you and I had kind of, I remember, you know, never having to think about worrying about religion, but now you kind of wonder if, if you're going to be allowed to 
express yourselves, have an opinion, and actually act on that opinion in the in the public sphere. So it's important to think about, important to talk about. And I think going back to um, the sort of divisions and stuff, one of the things I kind of took away from the conference was, you know, you had seven different different clergy members talking about their religious faith, but they all kind of try to bring it back to this understanding like there's um, sort of a shared humanity and that religion tries to, you know, it fails many times just because it's humans, but it tries to uh, inculcate virtue and it tries to inculcate sort of a respect for others and sort of a, an understanding of a greater community that you have to go out and serve and sacrifice for. And so that was kind of the, I think one of the key takeaways the conference was trying to, to break away was, boards, you know, not everyone has to be religious, but religion in society can be good for society as a whole. And I think that's something to remember. So, okay. but you're right, it's a different time than when Harry Truman was president. I think that's the biggest misconception about like, you know, people that, you know, aren't part of religion and sit on the outside. They, they, it's not the fact that they disagree or they're, they, you know, with the idea of religion. It's the fact that they kind of demonize it. They, you, you mm -hmm. know, and I, it provides good to society, you know, like I, I remember reading uh, Ben Franklin's, you know, uh, biography and trying to figure out like where he felt because there were there were times in the federal convention where he would draw on God and draw on, um, you know, religion to kind of make his point. But in his personal life, he wasn't really, you know, he wasn't really a faithful man and he was a little bit more secular. And I think he has a quote and I, I can't think of it off the top of my head where he's basically like my my idea is like maybe I don't believe in God, but religion is good for society. You know, basic, very, you know, I'm totally butchering it, but some something around that kind of concept. And, you know, I think that if you are a person who, you know, one, if you haven't gone to church and you, and you haven't actually studied Christianity or, or any faith, it's hard to make up your mind. And I think a lot of people end up outside the faith just because they don't, they don't look into it. They don't know what they're talking about. I was, yeah. I have to be one of the, I happen to be one of those people, right? And so that's number one. Number two, if you have looked into it and you don't believe, okay, cool. But you don't really know either, right? Like we don't know. I think that's kind of the whole point, you know, like, and who, if, if, if the thing is doing more good than harm, you know, and in, I would say Christianity, religion as a whole does a lot more good than harm. What are you like, what's so wrong about people believing? and and god and and these things that maybe you can't explain with science you know um but i don't know but i'm kind of off on a tangent here now no but that's very true i mean and you know I, you talk about christianity and I, part of the thing was that it's above it doesn't have to be christianity like um you know the muslims they have ramadan which is similar to like the christian lens but it's a, basically a month of very intense fasting and um i was reading some interesting article actually i think it was tim carney that wrote a piece about this but just the fact that like economic output in Muslim countries decreases during the month of Ramadan. But overall, they tend to be happier because they go through this process of personal purification and, you know, a sacrifice, again, a sacrifice for something greater than themselves. And, and like that small one twelfth of the year kind of filters into the rest of the 11 months of the year and, uh, you know, can help make you a better person. So, and I, yeah, just because someone doesn't follow a particular faith doesn't mean they have to be ostracized. But again, like, um, and just because, you know, religious people do bad things, I think all people do bad things. And that's just human, again, human nature uh, and having to recognize that and, and realizing like where the good can come out of it. And uh, and again, as you said, like overall, it tends to be better for society. Yeah, I agree. And you you bring up a point on kind of segue into our, our next topic here. You know, it's like there are always everybody's kind of good and bad, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You know, like we all do good things. We all do bad things. I, th I think we try to do our best not to do bad things, but like we're not perfect people. Um, this idea that like, you know, the political sides, like you cannot say that all Democrats are this thing or all Republicans are this thing because nothing is really all of anything, right? It's it's a variation of different things. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm reading this Harry Truman biography and this is just, this is, fantastic like it, i i can't believe i didn't read this sooner um and he is he is this like midwestern 
you know, farmer who becomes president and he's kind of this, you know, um, I don't know, kind of like he's a nerdy looking guy. You can kind of see him back there with his glasses and and he's, you know, not too big. Um, he goes off to World War One and is a leader of men, if you will. Um, he comes back, he becomes a politician, he works his way through the Senate. And before you know it, he's being basically handpicked to take over when FDR dies, which, by the way, FDR died at 63. And the way that they talked about him in the pictures that I saw, like I always imagined he he was in like in his 80s, but he was only in 63. And a lot of them say that was the toll from the war. Now, obviously, he had polio and they kept all that and and whatnot. But I found that interesting as well. And Harry Truman, man, he is like he is a brilliant politician. Like he is what I think people are looking for today, you know, in a lot of ways. He um so I just want to a few things that he had to go through as president. So he took over and it was in World War II. And so he had to he had to be the president to decide to drop the the bomb, right? On Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, he had to basically take over negotiations with the Allied powers and then negotiate the peace afterwards after basically being completely kept in the dark by FDR as vice president, completely kept in the dark as a senator before that. And he has to go in like just this aw shucks type of Midwestern charm and negotiate with some of the with one of the most ruthless people in history and Joseph Stalin, right, um, to defeat another most ruthless person in history, Adolf Hitler. Um, and he does this all while impressing Winston Churchill, you know, one of the most upstanding, you know, greatest men of the generation, right? And after that, do you know what Harry Truman's administration had to deal with after the war that is very relevant to what we're going on, going on right now in our society? So, uh, economic upheaval, right? They're just re everything returning back to normal. Think, think foreign policy. Oh, rebuilding. What happened after World War II that is being literally fought over today? Oh, the Middle East. Yeah, that's right. Pa Palestine and Israel, mm -hmm. right? So he he is tasked on this, and he supports. So the, he bungled this number one because he had. Uh, his, uh, I can't remember his position, but I believe it was George Marshall did not, he just, he wanted the uh, United Nations to take it as a um, partnership or something for like a limited time. I can't remember the, the correct terminology. And uh, Truman had decided otherwise. He had decided to support um, Israel, which I don't think it had a name at the time. It was just a, a, a Jewish state, essentially. Um, and But he had already approved it after he had said he supported it later. It came out that this other thing came out first. They had to backtrack it. Uh, it was this whole thing. But, you know, that part of the country was in British control before that. It was 1849, right? And that British control actually came from World War I. That's where they it was the it was the Turks or the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, fall the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, yeah, that had that land. And so I just I found it I was sitting I was sitting here last Monday and I was frustrated. Um I I follow this guy, Joe Walsh, on Twitter. He seems like a nice guy, um, or X or whatever you call it. He's a former congressperson. He's at the Principles First, which I've been to a few times, but he's you know, he's an old Tea Party Republican, and now he's like, he's so principle first, he's like a hardcore Democrat, you know, like Biden, 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 Biden. He's already writing off Haley or something, and I'm just frustrated. And I'm just like, look, I'm in my head, I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. Please stop talking. Let somebody else who knows better talk. And I'm just frustrated. I'm bitter. If I'm being honest, I'm just bitter, okay? I'm just bitter. And I'm just, I'm yelling at myself. And I'm just like, I shouldn't have done that. I'm just angry. Why do I have to go and tell somebody to shut up, you know, on Twitter and be that, you know, snippy? Um, and I kind of like, I yelled at myself. I said, I'm just frustrated. I'm just frustrated. I need to be inspired. What should I read? And that book came up. It can't like it was it was right there. The last 
presidential biography of a new president that I'd read because I've been reading rereading presidents over and over again was FDR. So the next one up is Truman. And Harry Truman happens to be a guy that my grandfather talked about a lot uh, as a kid. We used to sit in the kitchen and he would tell me about give him hell Harry. And I never really knew why. You know, he would tell me stories and whatnot. And I was a kid and I kind of forgot. And now I'm older and I just remember the the give him hell Harry thing, <laughs> my granddad. And um I understand why. Like he my grand he's he's very much like that Midwestern farmer. My grandfather was a carpenter, but and he was from Virginia, but that very much that same like idea of like work the land, you know, put your labor into things, you know, have a family, love your wife, you know, raise your family, raise your kids and whatnot. And just the way that Harry Truman approached issues is really interesting. And um, it led me to like learning all these things this week. And I'm like, that's, that's pretty cool, right? It's kind of like, you know, fateful, if you will. Yeah. Um, and the next thing after he did that, okay, so Harry Truman has now had to deal with all these crazy, crazy circumstances as an accidental president, even though it wasn't accidental, they wanted him there because they knew the type of person, the type of man that he was. And then he goes for reelection. And the Democratic Party at that period of time is it's split between basically white supremacy and where the rest of them, you know, <laughs> and he, Harry Truman had noticed um, that black Americans were starting to vote for Democrats on a state level. And the reason that they were starting to do this, even for candidates that were racist, and the reason that they were doing this, because they figured it was better to get something done than to get nothing done. And the Republicans uh, were, you know, they were big on the federal level, but I guess, you know, you know, in this limited scope, because this is Missouri, right? So I don't know on a national scale on a state level, but on the state level in Missouri, this wasn't working so well for Republicans. So um, basically, the Democrats had started to court black voters. Now, Harry Truman grew up in Missouri. His ideas and vision of race were shaped by his upbringing in the South. And by his political heroes, which happened to be Andrew Jackson and Robert E. Lee. So you can kind of imagine like what he thought about African Americans. Now, the fantastic thing about Harry Truman is he was a fairly humble man. And when he he saw what happened in World War II, and then he came home and he saw, you know, soldiers, black American soldiers that were being beaten and treated like second class citizens, and he realized this wasn't right. He knew what they they had as much right to this country as anybody else because they had sacrificed for it. And so he kind of had a change of heart and he goes forth, even though he's in the Democratic Party, the party of white supremacy, the party of the Confederacy. He put forth a civil rights platform that basically jumpstarts the civil rights era and he desegregated the military um, and he, and on his election day, which, you know, is a miracle that it happens, right? Because he's, it's the famous, have you ever seen Harry Truman holding a newspaper and it says Dewey defeats Truman? And that's because no one believed Harry Truman was going to, the only person that believed Harry Truman was going to win was Harry Truman. And I, I think the only reason that he believed that is because he's the only reason he's the, he was the only person in Washington who could see outside of the bubble. And that's mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, he was the regular person sitting there. He was the all shucks, Midwestern, you know, blue collar, you know, guy. But he was also incredibly well studied in history and which, you know, had him completely prepared for every unpreparable situation that he would face as president. And it allowed him to see a coalition of white middle class Americans, farmers and black Americans that would lead him to win the nomination in a huge upset. And it's this, he's holding it, Dewey defeats Truman. And, you know, the obviously Truman got the last laugh. And the year before, the Republicans were so convinced that 
they were going to defeat Truman, that they voted for the highest amount of spending for the, uh, the election day um, activity or not uh, for the um, the inauguration. They hadn't had an inauguration in years because of the war. This was going to mm -hmm. be the first one. Republicans have the Congress. They know they're going to win the presidency, and they they appro they appro uh, appropriate uh, the highest like it's like eighty million dollars, something ridiculous. And Harry Truman was happy to spend all of it as a Democrat, <laughs> and he he made a point to make sure that African Americans were welcomed at that inauguration. Now, I'm sure that is an easier task, easier said than done at that time period. I'm sure there are lots of hiccups. I mean, we're like I said, it was this was basically the beginning of the civil rights era. Um, so there's there's lots of places to go from here, but you know, you can't get anything done if you don't start it, right? And I just I found it fantastic. Like just Truman as an individual is just he's so he's so likable as a person. You I you cannot find um or at least I haven't yet. I, I will dig deeper. I haven't found people that speak too poorly of Truman. There's definitely some negatives here and there. Um, but as far as like the people that were closest around the, him, whether they disagreed with him or not, they still respected him. And I think that that is kind of you know what I take most away from from Truman so far. And then the he was like he was a partisan politician. Like he worked the. He worked through the state bosses like he when he was first trying to run, um, I believe it was for Senate, maybe it was for Congress. He was basically just hoping to get the approval of the party boss. And he was totally cool with that. Now, we are not necessarily cool with that. Right. And and it just kind of shows like in all in all segments of politics, there's always going to be bosses. There's always going to be restrictions like a good one is one that changes office right that was the idea of of congress that was the idea of jacksonian democracy you know blah 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 but it never really because the people get there and they always just keep it but harry truman was one of those people that understood that and he just tried to work through it and he worked through it all the way all the way to the presidency man and then because he was so well versed in politics and so well versed in history he was able to see a coalition that was there before any but before the republicans or the Democrats. And it basically saved the Democratic Party because that party was in shambles at that point in time. The uh, the white supremacy part of the party that broke off and formed the Dixocrat, Dixiecrats. Mm -hmm. They lost Southern states that they had, hadn't lost in years because of this, but they won three states that they never would have won otherwise without going out and putting forth a platform, a, a civil rights pl um, platform. And it's just... Uh, it's a testament to him as a politician. I can't believe, I cannot believe we don't talk about Harry Truman more. Like I just, I, I got, I'm getting through here. It's like all the talk about FDR and we just, we don't talk about Harry Truman. It's crazy. Well, there's a lot of history that, that you could say, like, oh, I wish we talked more about this, but um, I think, what is it? The, he's got the phrase, the buck stops here. He had that on his desk yep. or something. And, yep. you know, things, things happen. I think the problem is that some things happen. And so people are like, oh, see, he that was a bad phrase because he made some mistakes. But um, I think what, what you're, you're the point you're trying to make about the coalition building is so for so foreign to both parties uh, and and sort of the the party bosses now as they are like um, people really don't think about how am I going to bring other people along. It's just a matter of energize the base, energize the base, and then try to depress the other base, and then see where it all plays out. And so you raise gobs of money and you blitz the airwaves with television ads and radio ads and uh, of course nothing generally nothing positive in those ads it's always negative with the hope that you're just kind of like you know, just make people angry going back to what you were frustrated on monday it's just part of this whole negative partisanship where your your main goal is to make the other side look bad um you know, and not really change anything honestly it's other than you know get them out of power uh, well like it's I, it's always trying to force you to a decision. Like it's mm -hmm. everything is always like, it's gotta be this or that. Like, I, look, Trump is the worst thing ever, right? He's he's destroying democracy. So you have to vote for Biden. And it's like, I don't think that that has to be my options. You know, like they're only my options because you're saying they're my options, you know? And, <laughs> and the fact that 
it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's a story with Truman. He does this whistle stop, stop store, uh, tour because he puts forth the civil rights era platform and then he goes town to town and he sells it. He's the first pre sitting presidential candidate to uh, campaign in Harlem. Okay. He, for uh, um, to use a modern term, he knocks the doors the apps tell him not to. Right. Mm -hmm. He knocks all the doors. Right. He reaches out to all of the people, the people that the parties, both parties are ignoring. And there's a group of 50 journalists, the most famous journalists in all of America. And like 20 of them are on this tour with him town to town. They are mesmerized of how he connects with the people and all this stuff. And they take a survey and out of 50 of them. Zero of them pick Harry Truman to win the presidency. They don't believe in him. They see him up close, what he's doing in those little circles, but they don't believe that it's real because at the end of the day, they don't want to believe that it's real. And they said it. There's a quote in there from one of the journalists. And he's like, we wrote every day that he was going to lose because that's what we really believed. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they were wrong. They were only writing you know, they weren't able to see outside of the picture, which, again, I think at this time period of history, you just have this influx of intellectuals that have kind of been recirculated through the government and you grow up inside of a sphere. Mm -hmm. You're in you're unable to see outside of the sphere. And then the thing that always reforms us as a nation, whether it's a party or a government, is somebody coming in from the outside. And and just taking a fresh look at things and going, mm, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should do this. Hey, I have a question. Why do we knock only these doors on the app? And then when you ask that question and the and the people, they go, I don't know, because these are the ones that vote for us, you know, like whatever it is. And it's just go, yeah, but don't we need more people to vote for us? Why shouldn't we knock the ones in between? We, if we knock the doors in between, we're spreading our message further. Well, they don't want to hear it. So we're not going to tell it to him, you know, and, and Harry Truman walked in and goes, here's what we got to do. And he did it and he couldn't even get, you know, he did it all on his own, basically. I mean, not really. He had a team of people. Everybody does, but it's just, it's a great story. It's fantastic. Now, would you say the the civil rights platform that he kind of champions, was that his idea or was that some, someone, something that had been going around that he kind of latched onto and then based on his experience, he kind of picked it up. Like, I think of like Lincoln, like Lincoln wasn't an abolitionist when he ran for Senate. Um, but as he got to know people, like he becomes good friends with Frederick Douglass, he sees the truth and the merit of the abolitionist movement and sort of adopts it and then becomes a champion of it. Is it kind of the same for Harry Truman? Or is it the kind of thing where he just, he, based on his experience, he realizes like, this is the way to go and I'm going to lead on this. So I, I to give you a solid answer to that, I would just need to study more of his writings and papers and mm -hmm. kind of piece it all together. Um, what I can tell is he definitely started thinking about this while he was in the Senate. He, you know, be, even before the war, he'd already in. And, and look, he used very colorful language. He straight up said that he didn't think that white and black people were equal at some point in time it, early on in his uh, in his career. But, you know, he definitely this was a slow evolution evolution for him a, a change of, of heart or a change of thinking of things and so he definitely had thought about this in the senate i don't necessarily know if it's like his plan i know that specifically he put forth this plan and then i'm going to butcher his name is it herbert humphrey herbert humphrey i yeah, believe hubert hubert Hubert. that's what i yeah. like because i i get it confused with hoover all the time and it's just like it's hard anyways he basically championed or, or seconded um, Truman's plan. And he was younger and more energetic. And he kind of, he, I think he, him backing this up is kind of where that reform for the Democratic Party came from was, you know, the Dixiecrats left, which created new opportunity, right, for people into the party, new leadership. That's what I talk about all the time. If you want to fix things, if you want to reform things, you have to create opportunities for new people to come into the fold. That's what uncapping the house is. So, by the Dixiecrats leaving the party, it opened up more opportunities. It opened up more space for other ideas to be talked about. Now, remember, the Democrats are the same party that put in the gag rule in Congress to silence any talk about abolitionists, right? They, sir, that was in, 
that was the most egregious violation of the First Amendment that we have ever seen in our country, and it's never really talked about, you know? Mm -hmm. And they were finally gone out of the party, and finally you were able to have some new ideas be taken, and, and by having new opportunities and new people having more chances to speak, I think it really set it off. Uh, he His energy, I think, helped sell it to the American people, and then just Harry Truman as an individual, man, like he was just he was a smooth talker, you know, um, humble. It was a little bit little bit insecure here and there. But for the most part, just really confident man. Um, he he knew what he was good at. and He knew what he wasn't good at. And he was OK with it, you know, um, and he kind of talked about, you know, the presidency. And he said, look, I think that there's probably 100 people in the world right now that would be better suited to be president than me. But I'm president, so I'm going to be president. You know, and and just understanding that, like, look, you know, you're not, you're never going to be the best. You're never going to be perfect. The best you can do is do your job to the best of your ability every day. And that's what he went in and tried to do. Um, we need more of that. We need more of that, John. Yeah. No. I'm, I'm like that's recognizing your state in life is a uh, key to happiness and contentedness, and uh, recognizing that you're the president, and not someone else, when you're in that position. Like, you know, that's um. Especially, I mean, like you think about like but dropping the atomic bomb, everyone likes to go back and play it and say like, what would I do in that situation? And you just, you can't imagine what it's like to be in those shoes, but um, you know, he did it, you know, he was, he had to make that tough decision and he made it. Uh, and we are t here today where we are, uh, you know, maybe with another uh, nuclear war erupting soon in the Middle East, but. Um, well, I mean, look at, look, I mean. <clears throat> It's you look at all the players, they're all the same players from World War II. Mm -hmm. And if you look at World War II, they were all the same players from World War I. And if you you can tie something from each one of those wars all the way to today. And yeah. you know, I'm not saying that we are in World War Three. I'm saying that World War Three is always a possibility because of these things have never really been addressed properly, or maybe they mm -hmm. were addressed and then forgotten and ignored. You know, um, I think one of the biggest, you know, we just, we need, we need leaders who understand that they're all connected. They understand the history of these things when they're in Congress, you know, um, and so they're prepared to actually deal with them and speak about them educatedly, as opposed to, I don't know, just getting on TV and saying whatever the party tells you to. <laughs> right. Actually, and like, you know, the whole Chinese-Taiwan relationship problem, like going back to things that's not resolved, like that's straight out of World War II where you've got the uh, communists take over the mainland China and all the nationalists leave to the to the island of Formosa, now Taiwan, and are start their own country. And I think some people, you know, I, I think there's sort of like this, uh, um, what is it, the, sort of a disagreement over who Taiwan is. Is it the old Ch Chinese country? Is it still part of mainland China? Uh, you know, and as it is like both, I'd say the United States treats them as two different countries, but I, I think there's like some weird thing where we don't actually technically have some kind of formal relations or, you know, just again, because we're trying to um, go the line, you know, go the line or like take that delicate balance and not upset things. And, you know, at some point, the apple cart will be upset and it's about how you respond to that and how you whose position inside you take on that yeah and, and honestly i think harry truman kind of um and his team misplayed that hand a little bit to, to be honest with you and a lot of a lot of credit goes to harry truman for he did a lot of fantastic things but like i said nobody's perfect right mm -hmm. and and harry truman his team felt that the nationalists were going to be able to hold off communism and they probably didn't give enough resources or support <laughs> Because I think they said that uh, there was a timeline in the book from when they were talking about it, and it was significant. It happened significantly faster than the timeline. Timeline. So, um, and you know, and then of course, right after that, what did you see? You see Korea, right? Mm -hmm. So it was successful in China. The United States stayed out militarily because China is a big country, and that would have been a big war to pick a side on. Um, and you kind of were flat-footed because you, I, I guess they weren't prepared. It doesn't seem like, again, I need to study that a little bit more. Um, but then you had Korea that happened right afterwards where the, the you know, North Korea invaded South Korea. And 
again, you look today and you, you look at Pas Palestine and Israel, you look at North Korea, you look at Russia, you look at China and you go, okay, you know, Germany's not part of that anymore. They're on our side, but you know, you, you look at Ukraine, Ukraine, you, I mean, Russia's trying to put the old gang back together, you know, yeah. like you know, at the end of the day, I mean, the foreign policy, everything, I think we talk about it a lot is like, everything's kind of groups. Uh, Republicanism is, is governing by small groups. And what makes Republicanism great is you can be independent and separate, you know, like independent little sovereign nations, independent little sovereign districts with your own special rules and regulations. So everybody in that district's happy. That gives you the most freedom. But when things get tough, you join your groups together and now you have a bigger group and that's what foreign policy is. Right. And that's why, that's why it's, you know, if you're an American citizen and you want to be a strong you know, country and be in a safe country, then you want the union to hold, right? Because that union is what keeps you safe from outside invaders. And then as, you know, we have to keep our allies happy and secure and safe in order, because if the other team, if the other team grows their team too big, they'll envelop us, you know, and yeah. we have to have to remember that. And, and again, it's not advocating a policy in any direction. I don't, you know, without getting national security briefings. I mean, how could I really know what we should be doing right now? Um, but just from an outside perspective of how foreign policy kind of operates and, and, you know, a little bit of the history, I just think, you know, we have to, we just need people who think about these things more deeply, I think, in, in, in Congress and in, in, on TV or writing about it, you know, not to say there, there's, I'm sure there's plenty of people writing, you know, very eloquently about it. Um, I just haven't read it. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fine, I've got to find him in the right spot. Um, no, I, I mean, like the thing with foreign policy and again, banding together, there's kind of this idea from European history of the balance of power and sort of, you know, as France will get too large or England will get too large, like the, the little guys around them would sort of band together in order to be that balance. Mm -hmm. And I think the interesting thing over the post-World War II world is that there actually hasn't been kind of that balance up until maybe like the past 20 years or something um you know like it was it was kind of russia versus the the west um but the west was so much stronger that and and also stronger but also not really willing to wanting to kind of aggravate a thing i think you know before that it was kind of like if you were the strong man you just go and start taking territory because that's what you did you know you you're the austrian empire you start doing some marriages you pick up spain and then you get a bigger empire and then people get worried about that. And, and I think the interesting thing, you know, post-World War II was that the people at the top weren't necessarily interested in acquiring more territory. It was more of just kind of let's live our lives and, uh, you know, try to work in harmony. Um, and that's kind of, you know, maybe with the, with the, because you had an enemy of the Soviet Union, it was easy for everyone to kind of band together and have that sort of mindset. And then once you, once the Soviet Union goes under, Everyone kind of, you know, they, it takes a decade or two, but they kind of forget about that and they get busy and distracted with their lives. And now you're at the spot where um, there was kind of a weird shifting and balance where you've got China and Russia kind of cooperating and, you know, everyone throws Iran in there as sort of part of that. And it, you have this new uh, dynamism where, where there is kind of a reshifting and restructuring of these old World War II countries uh, into a different balance of power. And it's, you know, they're, they're willing to rattle their sabers or even start striking at the targets in order to um, show their, their will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the, you know, you look the, in the nineties and, and even, you know, it started with, with Nixon, with China, trying to open up relations with China and then, you know, both mm -hmm. China and Russia in the, you know, in the nineties and into the two thousands, just like, they were like our friends kind of, you know, like we were right. opening up McDonald's and, and sharing video games and, you know, uh, you know, Yao Ming and, you know, like everything was, everything was fun and it was good. And everybody was making money. <laughs> like at the end of the day, yeah. like everybody was making money. China was making money. Russia was making money. Capitalism was working. But, you know, I think what happened is the dark countries, if you will, the ones that, you know, have communism and have authoritative rule, they realized how to use the capitalist system for bad. 
you know, yeah. to infiltrate certain, you know, places in society and pull certain strings and, you know, and I think, you know, maybe we had our guard down a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe we should have been a little bit more thoughtful about how much and how easily we allowed foreign money to flow through the United States, um, specifically when it comes to campaign finance, but that we will get into on another day. <laughs> let's, let's get back to Harry Truman. Okay. All right. Um, so one of the, uh, he's just like, he's just this really interesting character. One of my favorite stories is he, his wife, okay, he meets her when she's very young, when they're both, you know, younger, and he writes to her regularly, and he's just, he wants to marry this girl. He He's, he's infatuated with her, and he, but he's, you know, he's not, he's not the guy, you know, he's like the guy, he's like a regular guy. And so he writes to her expressing his intentions and is rejected. Um, now, we don't have the rejection letter because Bess's letters weren't saved as thoroughly as Harry's was. But we do get an idea of what the rejection letter was because we get to read the letter that Harry sent to her afterwards. And he's basically like, hey, I appreciate you let me down gently, essentially. You know, like. I never would have forgiven myself if I didn't take my shot. You know, he doesn't say that, but he, you know, he's like, why would a guy like, why would a girl like you want a guy like me? I just appreciate your friendship. Blah, blah, blah. And they stay in touch and they stay friends. And then one day Bess realizes that that's the guy. It was always the guy. She didn't know it was the guy. And Harry doesn't make her feel bad about it at all. He's just there and ready to go. And they're just so devoted to each other. And it's just such a wonderful story. Well, it is important to have a wife that uh, supports you and is there in the long haul. Well, and so that's the crazy part. When when they got to the presidency, when they got to the White House, the the Roosevelts like didn't even share a bed the entire time they were there. They didn't share a room. Why they, they didn't even share the house. Like they just weren't there. They lived in separate parts. They were just gone from each other. They didn't have a real relationship. Um, I remember learning that when I read FDR's biography and then getting reinforced in Truman's bi biography now where the Trumans were like a real family, you know, like, and I think that's, you know, that ties to, I think one of our other big issues in we don't elect people to office that are actually family people, right? And, you know, it's not to say that FDR, you know, didn't deserve to be president and he wasn't a, you know, above average president. There were a lot of things that he did that I think other people couldn't do. And I think that we're grateful to have him at that moment in history. But as a person, I don't know, man. Like, he's not the type of guy I want my son to grow up to emulate. Um, he's not the type of guy I want to grow up to be. I'd much rather be a Harry Truman than an FDR, you know? And th it brings me back to the the civil rights thing. There's a quote in the book about um, the, uh, I think Strom Thurmond, who is the, he was the presidential candidate that broke off and, and was in the D Dixiecrats. And the Democrats at that point in time had been quietly talking about civil rights for some time. And FDR had played basically lip service to this. And uh, somebody asked Strom Thurmond, why now did he break off from the Democratic Party? But when FDR was doing it, he stayed quiet. And he said, because Harry Truman means it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, like, that's a lot of politicians will talk and uh, that's sometimes they talking out of both sides of their mouth. Um, that's crazy. No, I mean, I, I can see that, like, you know, and again, I guess it goes back to like the, the you know, backroom dealings, the sort of uh, conversations you have that are off the record. Like you could imagine FDR talking with Strom and be like, hey, you know, I'm going to say these things, but don't worry about it. And then it just gets back to you. Um, and I think the other thing with FDR too is he was really insecure, especially about his polio. And you know, he was never was he never photographed sitting or something. Most people didn't know he was went around in a wheelchair. He had the special like leg uh, structure he built so that he could sit and or I'm sorry stand for hours, even though his legs didn't actually work. And you know, um, and I I think all just kind of part of this this facade of of what he thought he should be and what he should how he should appear to people um and again it goes a little bit back to the you know, disingenuousness of fdr that people have uh, have troubles with and and kind of um 
you know, he did did some interesting, you know, did amazing things leading us through the World War II, but also, um, you know, he was, uh, I, I think also he was not good about bringing about the next set of leadership, right? Because you said like, he leaves Harry Truman in the dark. Harry Truman has no idea. Um, Harry Truman's kind of picked for more political reasons in terms of what he'll bring. I think there's a falling out. Who was the vice president before Truman? I forget. It wasn't like a falling out between him and, and FDR. No, they just, no, that he was actually very cordial. Um, wasn't it? He, I think he was the guy that was really cordial. I have to go back and look. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it, was it Wallace? I don't remember. Anyway. Anyways, I'll, uh, I'll have to go back, but I mean, Truman, um, the, uh, sorry about that. Um, FDR, you know, he was a little unsavory. And so one of the things that I, I took away is at this time period, you've got this really like good individual in Harry Truman and he took over the presidency at a very dark time in the war. Right. And then the cold wars afterwards. And, you know, a lot of people today are concerned with, you know, we, we hear a lot about the deep state, right. Yeah. And like, what exactly is the deep state? And where did the deep state come from? And what are their roots? And I think I think I learned a little bit about that in this biography. And the deep state comes from, uh, oh, shoot, I, the G-men, FBI, and hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where's my book? That's right, because you got Edgar, uh, J. Edgar Hoover is going around. Edgar Hoover. People so, so, and then, so when, when Truman becomes president, J. Edgar's office sends over some taps or something. And Truman is like, what the heck is this? And he sends back and he's like, I didn't authorize this. You shouldn't be doing it. We're not going to become a police state like the Soviet Union or like Russia. I don't think he didn't say Soviet Union, but yeah, like like Russia. And throughout his presidency, he does not like J. Edgar Hoover. And, and the thing that they said in the book was that Roosevelt liked to get liked Hoover a lot because he liked the secrets about celebrities that he shared with him because Hoover was tapping everybody. He was spying on mm -hmm. everyone. Right. And the crazy thing is, is Harry Truman, the underdog democratic president, Thomas Dewey was friends with J. Edgar Hoover and J. Edgar Hoover was feeding him information from what, from taps to like that's a criminal enterprise that's subverting the constitution right jagger hoover and and dewey like that is insane and you know if you're if you're wondering like if you're like a regular person watching and you're like how could people what is the deep state and how could people believe that that is such a thing that this would never happen all you have to do is read a little bit of history and go well it's kind of already happened and you know it's not to say that everything that the conspiracy people say is true it's just to say that there is some truth to it and so there's merit to their claims and then if you don't take them seriously they say well you're you're wrong and like that's again going back to building uh, coalitions and listening to people uh and having a historical founding to realize that like there is truth when some people tell you some stuff yeah it's um it's important to have all that uh, no i mean you sent me a uh picture from the wiretaps about the Truman throwing it back at J. Edgar Hoover. But, um, you know, that's, I think that that needs to be told more. The fact that, I think people are familiar a little bit with the wiretaps that was going on, but the fact that that Truman was so um, abhorred by it and said, like, stop it immediately. Like, this is wrong. We're not this kind of country. You know, I think, you know, it'd be, it would behoove maybe more, uh, elected you know current bureaucrats and political appointees to kind of to actually point out if things like this happen um and to let people know and, and kind of rebuild that trust well and, and another thing you know like so there was this idea you know of who's supposed to be in control and you know i don't think the fbi was ever supposed to have the amount of control that it has especially mm -hmm. you know like maybe it doesn't have that amount of control now i'm not i, I got to do some more research before i give it a solid answer on that but i think back then for sure it had way more control than it was supposed to have and that's simply by the fact that the president can't stop jagger hoover from spying on american citizens right. and <clears throat> and so i think uh i kind of lost my train of thought there i'm sorry hold on what was i going with that He's spying on politicians. He's spying on, so the kind of people that actually could have oversight of him, he's got dirt on them, and then he can use that as leverage to 
keep himself in power. And it's sort of this self-perpetuating uh, cycle of someone uh, not being able to get be, got rid of kind of like a mob, mob boss. Yeah. Well, and, and Truman, you know, he just, he wanted to protect American virtue. He wanted mm -hmm. to re re protect democracy. He wanted to protect, you know, the, the Republic, if you will, you know, he, he understood the values and he understood that, you know, that thing was, it's not the right way to win at the end of the day, you know, like yeah. you, you can win and you can sink to your opponent's level, which is, I think what happened to us at that time period, it was like, you know, the FBI became all powerful because there were all these foreign, you know, foreign operations and spy operations. And we needed it. We needed it. I think the CIA comes probably pretty shortly afterwards, I'm guessing. And, you know, it corrupted us a little bit, you know, like I think we sent American capitalism into communist Russia and China because we wanted to like, you know, bring some virtue, you know, reverse corruption and reality it got corrupted. And I think what happened is, is that fear and that distrust after World War II of what happened of having to do it again you know, it scared us a little bit and we lost a little bit about ourselves. You know, there's the whole debate about who should be in charge of the atomic bomb. Should it be the right. military or should it be the president? Right. And and Harry Truman was like, it should darn well be the president. It needs to be under civilian control because the civilians are the ones that that risk losing, you know, um, it's yeah. So I, I just a lot of things changed at that time period in time, you know, and and again, why do we not talk about Harry Truman more? Sounds like a conspiracy, you know, just people trying to keep it under wraps. Yeah. Well, let's transition a little bit from Harry Truman to John Beatty. Okay. So John Beatty's running for Congress. John, did you know that you're running for Congress? I, I was the one who signed the papers. So on. Okay. Well so as your campaign consultant i just like to let you know that the unrepresented people that harry truman saw back then those are the sun, same unrepresented people that we see today and the way that we're going to win our election is by doing the same thing that harry truman did we're going to go out we're going to meet with those people we're going to give them an opportunity to talk we're going to show them that somebody cares and somebody's going to represent them um and so we got a few announcements we want to share uh things going on for the campaign so uh, we've got three Meet John events. So this is, uh, it's going to be at Great Main Brewery on Monday the 5th, Monday the 12th, and Monday the 19th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Now, you'll be able to come out and meet John because he's going to be your representative. And you really should be able to talk with the person that represents you in Congress. So we're trying to make it easy. You know, three three Mondays, you come out out, and John, what do the people get? We're actually going to provide a libations, if you will. Uh, so if you come out to Great Maine, we'll we'll give you a beer uh, on us, just to, you know, sweeten the deal. Uh, if you don't drink, that's fine. We'll get you a soda, no problem. Yeah, delicious root beer. And they've got they've got water too, if that floats your boat. So plenty of options. Um, they know the nineteenth is President's Day, so if you're not working, uh, I know it's going to work the next day maybe, but uh, it's another day that we're just trying to make it make it so that we can actually talk to people. Uh, that uh, so we can represent, you know, so I can represent you, you know, so you can be represented in Congress. Um, it was funny, actually, just you mentioned the CIA because there was a lunchtime discussion about the CIA not having uh, sort of like in, the intelligence community not being able to share things and then people not trusting them. And then I was kind of thinking about it. It's, it's a lot like representation where, you know, your, your elected leaders, sometimes they can't really share things with you, but if they don't have a relationship, with the people that they're supposed to represent when big uh problems happen and trust gets frayed if if you don't you know know them well uh you it's easy for the trust of the community the trust the uh the, the body politic to be lost and then things start getting in a downward spiral and that was exactly what happened on like the loudon county school board you know um i think it was a a brand new board shortened the term and you had the pandemic and not enough time for kind of actually even within the board for for relationships to be built. Um, and then that leads to problems further down the line. So this is an opportunity for anyone. We'll talk and, uh, you know, share ideas. I'll listen to you. 
um, and, you know, let you do most of the talking so I can be a better representative. Well, I mean, and as a as a citizen and a campaign consultant, what I would tell you as a, if you are going as a citizen, you shouldn't just do all the talking. You should you should get John to talk and you should make him talk about things you, you know, just ask him questions and listen to what he has to say. And that's I think that's kind of the part that we lose as citizens is this idea that the representatives are supposed to do what we tell them. But the but there's so many more of us than there is of them. So they can't just do what you tell them to do. They have to like listen to everybody and kind of formulate their own ideas. And those ideas should be formulated on hard work and study of history. And that's what, you know, John's bringing to this campaign. Um, and that's why he would be the he's going to be the guy to to win this election and and to bring actual representation to to Congress. So um, but it's not going to happen alone. We need lots of help. We've got two more events on our calendar coming up. Um, we've got two door knocking events on the 10th, February 10th and the 17th. Now, we understand that this is February, so maybe it snows and maybe it gets canceled, but we do plan to knock. Um, or maybe it'll be 70 degrees because the weather's crazy around here. You never that's know. That's right. <laughs> and uh, when you come out, you're going to get a script. You're going to get some training. You're going to get some coffee. Okay. You're going to get a map and directions and where to go. And then you're going to knock all the doors. Okay. I know that's going to be a strange concept for some of you out there, but it's important that we go to everyone and not just the people that we always go to. Um, and then John, we've got another. I've got another event. This is a little. This is off the campaign. Uh, we'll call it a Madisonian uh, event. But I don't know if you noticed, but I've been drinking Heritage Brewing beer tonight, and they've got uh, it's American Expedition, and it's located here in Manassas or nearby in Manassas. And the owner asked me to do tank talks, um, mm -hmm. and we're going to start those uh, the last week of February. Uh, it's going to be February twenty sixth, and the first tank talk. Is about George Washington. It's going to be from six thirty to eight. Um, you can register. You can register on the Madisonian Republican website, um, and then come out. And let me tell you a story about George Washington. Let me tell you about how you know he started in the French and Indian War, and then ended up you know leading us to independence, breaking free of Britain. You know governing our nation, overseeing the constitution. It's just a fantastic story. So uh, it'll be a good time. Um, You're gonna I've, talk about him uh, retiring peacefully at the end and, and letting go of power. That's a lot of people could take a lesson from. And speaking of Harry Truman, Harry Truman also, he could have run for another term, term but he decided not to. And his one of his heroes was also Cincinnatus, just like Washington. There you go. So lots of upcoming events, um, you know, for the campaign. And then if you're just a history nerd who happens to be listening to the show because we talk history, you've got a tank talk that you can come out to. Um, but what, you know, I think my outside view um, from politics is sometimes if you want to volunteer for a campaign, they don't necessarily have things for you to do. They don't really necessarily explain it. So on our website at... Uh, um, 84.us um, you can go to our volunteer page if you're looking you, maybe you don't have money to donate but you still want to make some difference um, you can go to our volunteer page you can sign up to be a volunteer we've got a few different options for you we've got a door knocker we already talked about that we've got two events on the calendar already um, we can train you we can give you a script we can help you get through it is it's a different experience but it's enjoyable um, we've got small group leaders if you this is probably the best way for somebody to be involved that doesn't like confrontation. You can just invite your favorite people to your house, the, the ones that even if you disagree, you'll be you'll disagree civilly, and then just invite John over. Let him talk to him. Let him share what his plan for congressional reform is and help us build a coalition to win the primary. Um, and then social media. So social, there's two different ways to, to help out for social media. You can just be part of our social media team retweet, like, share anytime we post anything. Or you can be part of our social media content team. This is for somebody that's a graphic designer or just an artist on the side. They just want to put things together. I come up with lots of ideas, but I run out of time every day, right? Just putting together some graphics, quick things that John can post regularly. We like to keep them informational. Our goal is not to just spam people with ads. We want to give them valuable information that they can actually help them in their day-to-day -day lives. And we'll also show 
John's strength as an individual going into Congress. Um, and then we're looking for election day volunteers. Um, there's a you know lots of things that go into the election process. You got to have lots of people there passing out information. Um, so we'd love to you know just get that locked down and get out of the way. You know if you're close to John or myself, friends and family, and you really just want to you want to feel like you're being helpful. This might be the best way for you to sign up because you know you're you're locking down a position that we need. It gets it off of our plate, um, and we make sure that on election day we have the proper staff to make sure that we bring home the votes and we get that W. And uh, the, the election day volunteer would be incredibly important this time because it's going to be we'll need you know if we can we we'll get someone for every precinct and there's a, a lot of precincts in the uh, 10th district. Yes. Going back to the districts being too large. Hmm, I wonder if anybody could do anything about that, John. Someone can, Jeff. It's it's uh, in the Constitution, you know, the ability for the House of Representatives to set their their uh, what is it requirements for membership, or the number of members, all sorts of things that Congress actually has the uh, authority and the ability to do. So uh, it it can be done. Yeah, we just we just need a congressman to walk into Congress and yeah. and kind of remind them of their power. Just be like, hey, you remember this is our job? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, real excited. Um, you visit our website. If you're not on our email list, go to our email list. Um, remember, the website is 84.us. Um, and, you know, if you have the ability and you want to donate, please donate. We need your money. I'm not going to lie. It's expensive. You can donate up to $3,300 per election cycle, okay? So what that means is up until the primary, you can donate up $3,300. After John wins the primary with your $3,300, <laughs> you can donate another $3,300 so John can win the general election. And then we can have real representation in Washington that represents our district and our country with the values that it was supposed to have. Um, bring a little virtue back to the Republic, John by begging for money it's just part of the, what did i say i have my so i don't know if people know this but there's a big printout about all the rules it takes to run for congress and i well, i texted you jeff i was like don't hate the player hate the game i mean um but i, th I think the, the key thing we're doing is we're not going to waste the money uh and you know personally last time i ran like i wasted a lot of the money people get and i feel bad about that so i'm we're gonna we're gonna use it very prudently, very wisely, and it's gonna be used to actually talk to people um, and and get their votes and win the election. You know, so, none of this wasting on consultants that just kind of say they do a lot and not do anything. Um, you know, it's all for this service of like actually talking to people and, and getting the message out there. I was gonna ask you how do you think you waste the money, but I think you just answered it. <laughs> Did you? Did you mention the word consultant? It's a it's a bad word around here. Well, you know, again, it, you got to get the right people. We actually one of the best things this time around is we have an amazing team, uh, a lot of great volunteers helping to to uh, make things happen. Um, and you know, Jeff, you're you're the leader of the group, so to speak, in terms of that and like helping. Um, and it just like it's just, for me, it's a, just a totally different feel this time around where. Um, I'd be like, you know, we should probably be doing this. And I'm like, you already got it done. Um, and uh, that's, it's just like night and day from last time. So it's, I'm feeling good about this. I've, you know, I've always, at the end of the day, being a political consultant is a business. And if you're going mm -hmm. to charge somebody for a service, you should probably provide that service. Otherwise, what you've actually done is called theft. And I think that this is something that is over, it, it's it's not really talked about in our society, how this operates. I think that's, you know, what is grift? MAGA Republicans, you know, uh, progressive uh, individuals, they think the system is grifted. Where is the grift? I think, I think we touched on the grift. I think the grift mm -hmm. is somebody promising you that they're going to do something, taking your money and then not doing that thing. And I think at the end of the day that the reason that it happens is because in order to be a good political consultant, you have to both be an admin and a study of history. And I think because we're not talking about Harry Truman, I think the consultants aren't really studying their history. I think they're focusing on their marketing game. And that's yeah. all well and good. And it wins when you get when you get somebody that can get you out there and help you market. 
But if you really just have a person who's really qualified for Congress, it's probably hard to market that person. Um, and so your traditional means don't work. You're not well versed enough in history. And so, you know, whether you intend to or not, maybe you just fail. And instead of just owning up and returning the money and being like, yeah, I didn't actually do anything I promised to do, you just keep it and you move on to the next guy. And then yeah. it's a repetitive cycle that just happens over and over again. John, you know how many co candidates in private tell me that they feel like their consultants took advantage of them? Like, it's insane. I guess 100%, 100% of all the candidates you've talked to. No, not 100%. I'm not going to go that far. But a yeah. few, a few have. And I just, you know, like I, I've told the story before. When I first got into entertaining politics, I asked people I trusted what I should do. And the first thing they said was, you need to hire a consultant and be careful. Like that was the advice that I got. And and I understand why. And it's not, again, it's just like you can't call all Democrats bad things and all Republicans bad things. All consultants are not bad. I, there are plenty of great consultants out there, right? It's just there are some bad ones. And you sh we should be able to like, we should talk about that as a society and realize that that's where a lot of the power goes. You know, it goes to the consultant. Um, and, you know, it takes away a little bit about the people's voice, but that's what, that's, what's great about America. Somebody could recognize the problem and find a private business oriented solution to the problem to make some real change. Um, and I think that's what we, that's what I've been trying to create. Um, and I'm glad to put it to action behind somebody I believe in somebody that I believe is qualified for the job. You know, um, and that, of course, is you, John. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for watching, listening. Uh, it's been a good thing. It's I've learned some some more stuff about Harry Truman. I, I'm like, we just don't don't study any history enough. You know, personally, I haven't studied history enough, but collectively, we are are lacking society and and what we teach and our sort of our interest in in learning from our our past so we can better our futures. So you can, uh, we can follow Jeff on Twitter, jmayhew28. I hear there's a, an op-ed of yours coming out sometime soon. So be sure to get on his Twitter so you can be the first to read that. I guess I was the first to read it, maybe the editor. So the second or third. Um, and then you can follow me, Beatty for us on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all those wonderful social media platforms that are just providing so much uh, benefit to society. Follow the podcast on politics and parenting. And uh, with that, have a great night, everyone. Peace and love.